I think of um, a weird little green leafy outfit from a, a cartoon. I think of green. I think of the colour green for some reason. Flying. Never growing up. Um, I think of opium. Green, green tunics. Green tunics. Green tights. Yeah, the shadow in the drawer. To be honest, I think of Wendy. Tinkerbell. Julia Roberts. But I also think of that line, um, boy, why are you crying? Really daggy um, flying apparatus. And funny little, like, elfie shoes. I don't even think that's in the show. <laughs> John, wake up. There is a boy here who is to teach us to fly. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's like one of those stories you think you know and then you actually go back and read the play and you go, whoa, <laughs> that's not what I thought it was at all. It's, it's a really kooky read. Yeah. It's weird and deeply kind of wrong. I thought it was good. I thought it was very uh, funny. And um, I think whoever wrote it will go very far. But he's this famous revisionist. He keeps on changing Peter Pan throughout his whole career, which is amazing to me because his obsession is obviously changeability. Where an adult somehow manages to find something that is like quintessentially of childhood. Um, and that's what I love about it. So there are many different versions of Peter Pan and so the job now is to try to knit them together and select the best bits. Um, ensemble. <laughs> he's great. Yeah. He's in it a lot. He's, yeah, he's in it a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Very varied. I think I'm Smee. Oh. I'm just me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just going to be Smee. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, Bob yeah. Hoskins and... Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Something about turning at a star. Yeah, it's like go down the street, go to Elizabeth Street, chuck a left, go left again on Cleveland. Back to never, never land. <laughs> yeah. Clicking your feet? I don't know. Uh, Click your heels and, and there's say no there's no like place home. like home. And then you float up in your pajamas. It's not on a ship, is it? You have to think nice thoughts. You have to think happy thoughts. Oh, you turn left at the end of the road and keep on going till morning? You have to go second on the right and straight on until morning. It depends how you phrase it, I suppose. You have to never, never land. And then you're off to never, never land. <laughs>
I don't know what's in the season. I don't care, to be honest. Um, I can tell you what I think should be in the season. Musicals. More musicals, mashups, uh, what the kids are talking about these days, where you two take two potentially disparate items, you stick them together, fiddler on the roof, but you ground it in something like Shakespeare, Hamlet, fiddler on the, Hamlet on the roof, say, if, if I was king of Denmark, da -da, to be or not to be, da -da 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 -da, you know, something like, my uncle killed my father, poisoned in his ear, at least what the ghost said, da -da -da. something like that. And I would love, at that point, to play Top Hole Hamlet. That's for me, cast as you see fit. Tragedies, the Greeks, the Greeks' tragedies, you know, Oedipus. You could do Greece, you could do Greece the musical, you could spell it Greece, G-R-E-E-C-E. -E -E. You could have the same logo even. That's genius. I think of lyrical, sensual, steamy. Steamy, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hot. Steamy, like a. Tortured, <laughs> obsessive. A sultry summer. Yeah, American like fans, kind of white thing and suits. Sexy. It's a show about big windows and curtains and drinking. I love it. I love Tennessee Williams. Simon's idea uh, to do Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. He kind of said it slightly sheepishly. He said, I, I, think it's, I think it's really funny. It's kind of not how you sort of necessarily think of the play. But then when you read it, you go, actually, this is very funny. It's a whole lot of people being really mean to one another, um, which is always funny. Who wouldn't want to do a play about a woman trying to get a gay guy to get her pregnant? So incredibly sexy. Like, it turns you on from the first scene. He had a couple of great casting ideas. He, uh, he said, you know, I want you and Leslie to play Brick and I want Jackie McKenzie to play Maggie. Uh, and we're like, great, let's do it. People are getting hammered. They want to get each other into bed. They want to fight each other out of, out of inheritances. A guy's discovering that he's about to die and that everyone's been keeping it a secret from, from him. It's, it's like all family dramas. It's the hotbed of all the most extreme nastiness and yet pure love. It's a role that a lot of people have played before, so at the moment it's really just about looking at a lot of different interpretations. Hi. Who? Um, can you say I'm busy? Hey Bren, how are you? Um, I don't suppose those crutches have arrived yet, have they? Oh well, there's so many crutches. Yeah, I'm a crutch actor, it's on my CV. I have to go, I have to go! Do you mean like shtick? Like we all have our crutch? Yeah, we all have our uh, thing that we lean on. And I want all of that southern sweltering passion to be able to exist on stage in the language uh, and in the interaction between some of Australia's most extraordinary actors. It's Tennessee Williams. It's hip, it's young, it's sexy, it's edgy, it's um, it's... Yui, have you actually read the play? No, I haven't. No, I have not. I, I really don't know what the show's going to be, going to be, really. Um, but, you know, we're in really safe hands with Annie Lou Sarks. We have no idea, but we're in safe hands with Ali Katz. Yeah. I was um, commissioned to write a play by Belvoir which um, is called Fortune. Unfortunately, they felt that that wasn't going to be ready for next year's season. That play didn't end up being part of the season, but just listening to Lally talk about um, how she spent a whole lot of dough uh, going and seeing fortune tellers in New York made me realise that this is a great story and that she tells it with such um, theatricality that it's like, why don't we just put you on stage telling this story? Belvoir quite, I guess they liked this idea, even though it isn't written yet, they thought it was more ready than my other play. And I met this one fortune teller, a young woman, um, I, well, I met many, but she was the one I got obsessed with. And um, I, I better not say her name, because I'm a little frightened of her. And, um, but she, um, she told me I had a curse, and um, that, that I was gonna have everything I dreamt of so long as we remove this curse. And she said, you know, the good news is it's easy. 
I can do it for you tonight for $1,100. I was concerned that she should have put some money away and she was saying it's okay because if I had we wouldn't have a show. It, it's fair to say I spent a lot of money but I think I feel like the curse was at least removed for a while. Fortune tellers in New York. Yeah. yeah that sounds pretty sure. good. Sure. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, sounds good. Anything that I live, there's part of me that's kind of living it and there's part of me that's going, hmm, good, this is good blood, this is good material. And often I'll put myself in experiences that may otherwise be unpleasant or kind of strange because I know that I'll get material from them. One thing that they did was they banned me from going to see the other ones, because they'd, I'd go in and they'd say, you've been seeing another psychic. And I'd go, yeah, I say, yeah, yeah, but I'm not really seeing her anymore. And they'd go, where is she? And I'd say, oh, um, yeah, I think she was on 25th Street. So they'd go, no, she's no good. She don't know. She don't know. I'd go, is she dangerous? Because like, I'd always say to the psychics when they were banning me from each other, oh, is, is, she, is she dangerous? And they'd go, ah, she ain't dangerous, but she just don't really have the power. And one night I got violently ill, but I think that was because of some sushi I ate from the chemist. But she assures me that she's a very good actor. She was in Ralph's Frankenstein. I was in that playing a rabbit, and I, I, I really liked it. I can't imagine Lally not being awesome, because I can't imagine her being anything but herself. I think more people should spend more time with Lally Katz. Yes, it's, it's, it's good to she, find um, a wider audience. I like performing. Like, I'm not, I'm not an actor, but I love being on stage and communicating with people. Like, I, like I, I, I can't think of anything that's more fun. <laughs>
these kind of like grey classic dimensions. When it was first produced, it was very much a play about the issues. The AIDS epidemic was uh, a new thing. Now we have um, some historical distance from it. Um, you can actually see that Krishna was writing this play, yes, about the, the unfolding tragedy of, um, of um, that disease, but also much more broadly about America and about us and about the world. But in fact, what it's really dealing with are the, those kind of contending forces of ideas, not just in American society, but in, in Australian society and in the West in general. Is it important that it's in New York? Um, is it important that it's in America? It's called Angels in America. Uh, so that's kind of unavoidable. Uh, but The Merchant of Venice is called The Merchant of Venice and everyone doesn't go, hey, Angelo, give me a pound of flesh. It felt like there was suddenly um, a whole lot of people who were perfect for the, for the roles. And then it also felt like that, um, that it would be kind of great to put that play in a corner stage and have it, do you know what I mean? Like, um, just right there, just there, angels fly in. People appear from the dead. He says add a week to tech, <laughs> but he also, he kind of reckons that you should, that it's important that the wires show and it should be ragged. Angels in America part two is one of these plays you go, is that a classic, is it a new play? I haven't found anyone yet. Ashton Kutcher. It's a love story. Hey, Angelo. It felt. Angels fly in. That the wires show and it should be ragged, yeah. Our production is, is based on the original film by Bergman and basically what we did is use the screenplay and the film itself as a springboard for making the work. So all of the text is Bergman's, all of the dialogue, but the, we've sort of reimagined it through, through the lens of theatre. Dina Jacobs, the director, came to us when we were programming this year's season, so 2012 season in, in 2011, with this idea of doing Persona. And I thought about it for a while and I thought, oh, I don't think that would work. I don't think it's a good idea to turn that into a piece of theatre. Uh, and Adina didn't listen to that piece of advice and went and did it anyway. And it was a triumph in the press described as being the best piece of theatre the, of the year, and the three performances were all described as being as being kind of virtuosic. Now Ralph's eating humble pie. Yeah, he sucked in Ralph. And he watches films, they're sort of about, they're sort of films about theatre in a way, they're films about performance in some way. Um, so it's not surprising. That actually became really interesting in itself of going, how do we change, how do we reimagine something that is totally for film, <laughs> for the stage? We work, worked on it for, five months in the rehearsal room and it took that long to kind of try and bring it away from that cinematic masterpiece that it is so um, yeah it was beautiful it was a beautiful uh, experiment really. I guess it's something we've talked about as like a radical kind of intimacy what is the most private taboo things you know you can show on stage and that's not sex or violence it's actually I mean in a way persona is about the performance of living you know rather than being theatrical in itself. The Balkham Hills African Ladies Troop. The Balkham Hills African Ladies Troop. It's a group of African women from Western Sydney um, coming together to share their stories and their culture and making a show about their journeys. The great Rose Horan um, has been uh, creating this project for some time now. I've been working on this two and a half years now, and it'll probably be three years, you know, before it hits the stage here. I mean, a period of locating the women, getting their trust, in-depth interviews, you know, probably did four or five hours of interviews with each of these women. And the result is, is, is this show, uh, which, is a, which is a kind of exuberant um, kind of expression of something that we just don't see on our stages. I felt I wanted to find a group of women who might want to share their stories and do something about what happened to them, how they got here, about discovering what the effect of the trauma is, what the nature of their resilience was, how they actually survived, and then the other enormous sort of transformation of trying to create a new life for themselves in Australia. Eritrea, Sierra Leone, Kenya, Burundi, you know, they're all from different places and their cultures are all different. I gathered a group of four core women who had extraordinary stories, and then I gathered a group of African professional performers, singers, drummers, 
dancers because I wanted the women to actually be in the show. And this is, they're in the show. And this is the kind of really big risk factor. I have to say, it's been one of the most joyful and uplifting experiences I've ever, ever had because these women are fantastic. They're inspirational and their spirit is so strong. And discovering what their resilience is about and their stories of survival has been amazing. And one of the things the women felt right at the beginning, you know, even though they are not performers, they're all very smart and savvy, they said, it's gotta be funny. It's a joyful celebration of the fact that these women have survived and they're making extraordinary lives for themselves here. Our theatre is shamefully for us really white and really middle class and this project is a big loving long leap away from that. Miss Julie, Strindberg. Brendan and Letitia worked on a great show downstairs in the end of last year's season called The Dark Room. And Brendan's performance in, in that was extraordinary. He managed to make a very ugly character very human. And we were talking about Strindberg and about how all his characters are kind of monsters in a way. And then the, the sort of penny dropped and thought, wow, he would be great as Jean. I just had the most invigorating experience on the dark room and I love her passion for the misunderstood. The first time I read it was, you know, that this uh, playwright is having a go at women who, who want to break out of their gender stereotypes. I said to my mother, I was in um, Brisbane at the time, and I said, oh, you know, this play, oh, this play. She said, well, why don't, tell me about it. And I started talking about it and she said, oh, read it to me. Towards the end of it, I got really, um, really upset, really moved for all the right reasons and I was no longer angry. I called Ralph and I said, yes, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, I, I can't stop thinking about her. And there's this guy who has his own dream but he's also, there's a, there's a masculinity about it that I, I feel like she's, she's attracted to, hopefully. Simon Stone is, is adapting the play but not directing it, Letitia's directing it. There's a, two very big, very robust theatrical imaginations there. So it's a thrilling prospect. What I love about it is that actually what it, I think it's trying to comment on is the way that patriarchy works against both sexes, particularly because it goes hand in hand with capitalism. And so it's not until class and gender politics unite against the struggle that anything's actually going to change. Moby Dick wouldn't work, would never work on stage. It's wrong, it's wrong, it's a stupid idea. Dick Tracy would work on stage. Uh, Moby, just Moby on stage, the other musician. I would like to do a one-man show about Moby. Buzz Aldrin, what happened? Went to the moon, came back, I don't know. I'd like to tell his story. I'd like to do walking on the moon. I'd like to do the Sting story. Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan. Mostly because I'd love, I see him with her. And he rode ponies. Adorable. That would be adorable on stage. That would be a kid's thing as well. Because your kids would come along, there's luck. You'd have the little, they're quite sturdy. You'd have Shetlands, you'd dress them up. Kit Brookman, he put on a really beautiful little play just around the corner from here, um, in a little space down on the corner of Kipax Street, just off his own bat. Directed his own play called, he um, called Heaven. But he's pretty amazing. Uh, both as a playwright but as a director as well uh, with an amazing ability to kind of direct his own work which is not easy. So we asked him to write something um, or whether he had written something um, and he had this play, Small and Tired. It's, it's sort of a family drama that takes its leaping off point as the Orestes myth. It's, a, it's not you know, an adaptation of Orestes, it's a contemporary Australian piece of writing that, that has these mythic references and, and uh, epic kind of Underscore. A man returns home after being away for a very long time uh, to sort of see his, his uh, sister and his mother, the way their past lives have unfolded. They've kind of missed the moment where they really could have been a family. Being constantly at war with each other and with the world rather than living in peace and cho cho pre 
preferring that, that state of war. It's written for the actors who will be playing the roles and you can really hear their voices in it uh, in a great way. Oh, Luke could be really good in this, actually. Um, and so I think once that idea had popped into my head, you know, unconsciously or consciously, it, it um, started to shape itself towards that outcome. That theatre, what's amazing about it is that it's so small, but nothing feels small in it. It still feels very big. It has a wonderful way of, of opening things out, um, both in plays and in performances, I think. It's great downstairs. It's so... You can really talk to people. They're right there and you can really talk to them and there's no... You, there's no sort of reaching. You don't ever feel like you sort of have to overreach or, or, or pump anything out. You can, you can talk to the other actor and you can, you can talk to the audience and it's, it's, it's authentic. It's just... Hi. Shakespeare's my favourite playwright and I think I'd been avoiding directing any of his plays for, for fear of being found wanting. Hamlet is without question the greatest play that's ever written. Every time I see it and every time I read it, I marvel at it. It's like a tense play, it's like quite tense and there's like quite a lot of like, it's quite like... Yeah, quite warm, and moody, yeah. uh, you know, melancholy. Two-hander? That it's insight into people, a whole lot of different people. It's humanity and it's uh, it's beauty. <laughs> um, it's about um, it's about time we saw. We, it's about time we actually saw it. Yeah. It's kind of a perfect play uh, for Simon to do. Um, I hope he wouldn't mind me saying that it's uh, a play uh, about a very smart young man who doesn't quite know how to deal with the loss of his father. There's an excitement, but also. A, a level of, um, of uh, carefulness that I need to have because there, there, there's, there, there's, too, there's slightly too many parallels uh, from the beginning of the play, although I'm not a prince or a king. It's something we always don't we come back to every time. Um, uh, I to keep trying to work out how to do it. Uh, you've Sorry, got at least Hamlet, yeah. isn't it? Usually a Ophelia. Love interest. Hangers on. Various hangers on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a clown, hopefully. No. No. Uh, Did it MTC? Remember him? <laughs> that's Remember actually, him? That's oh. actually not a bad idea. No. Not available. No. 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 Uh, no. I suppose so, if we have to. He'd definitely be available. I don't know his stuff. Simon obviously called me straight away and said, I'm not going to do Hamlet without you. I want you to do it. And I was like, oh my God. Um, yes. <laughs> I suppose yes. I wasn't going to do it without him. The Cake Man was, um, the first play that was produced at the National Black Theatre uh, in Redfern uh, in the 70s. Bob Mazur and Jack Charles uh, were the sort of artistic leaders of, of that project and the play was written by this guy Robert Merritt. There was this kind of amazing flowering of Indigenous playwriting in the 70s as part of the National Black Theatre and that we had a kind of an enormous number of, of great Indigenous playwrights at that time. It occurred to us that there, that there are sort of classics, classic Indigenous plays um, in Australia that don't often get done again. It's true of non-Indigenous theatre as well. But we have a shameful record of putting on plays once and not doing them again. We read this play, we realised it's kind of extraordinary. Um, it's kind of on another planet. It's epic and it's incredibly ambitious. So it starts in 1788 with this sort of notion of what family life was like just at the point of contact. Then we jump forward to this kind of big chunk of Indigenous naturalism and then at the end there's this kind of piece of direct address where um, the, the kind of father character who's been sort of deeply problematic sort of comes back and challenges the audience and says, you know, this is my life, kind of what are you going to do about it? Kyle Morrison, who's the artistic director of Yuri Yarkin in Perth, who's a really exciting um, young director, really loved the play when we sent it to him, had great ideas about it. And so we thought, you know, let's do it. Look, at its core, it's about family and about the impact that 
white settlement had on family, but also about how ways in which Indigenous families have sort of found ways to survive. So there is a real sense of sort of playfulness to it and kind of a bit of sort of challenge to it. I've, I've heard this, I've read this story. Playwright actually did that, but by the time the play was on, he was, yeah, he was in Long Bay. They let him out to see opening night, but he turned up, like shackled to, to two guards. The story goes that the cake, uh, the eponymous cake, it was brought up from the stage by one of the actors and sort of given to him and he couldn't, couldn't kind of really grasp it because he was um, handcuffed to two burly guys. And the guards are kind of standing there by all accounts next to him going, oh, you know, is there going to be a knife in this cake? Like, what, what happens now? That story says a lot about, um, about Australia in 1975 and I'm sad to say it says a lot about Australia in 2012 or 2013 as well. Just totally trust, love talking about stuff. You could ask questions just about, you know, what, what I like doing, things I've done, things I've seen. I'd like to teach painting on stage as well, just like an art class. Art classes, you know, in the upstairs as well, not the downstairs. A man and his easel, I would call that. And what people could do, they'd bring a colour in or a picture of a cat or uh, a loved one and I would paint them. <laughs> I would paint them. And that would be it. Current Works a project that we're working on with Ilbidri, the wonderful um, Indigenous theatre company from Melbourne that's run by Rachel Mazza. Current Dirk was an Aboriginal reserve, um, about 50 or 60 kilometres outside of Melbourne. And it was, a, it was an extremely successful Aboriginal reserve. That had been given to um, the Victorian Aborigines by the government and then there was very um, um, underhand um, and, and frankly kind of unpleasant um, um, moves to take it off them again by, lo by people who wanted it. The sort of rightful owners of the whole state of Victoria or indeed all of Australia who had, who had found themselves in this tiny little corner of it and then threatened with that being taken away put up a very fierce fight and a very passionate and reasoned uh, defence of why they should hang on to it. Basically an inquiry took place, a government inquiry, and that came about uh, in 1881. And so in the show that you'll be seeing is extracts taken from that official minutes of evidence document and applied to the show. So what we're seeing and what we're hearing are actually words that were spoken in 1881. It's like a piece of verbatim theatre that say, you know, David Hare would make where he goes out and talks to a whole lot of, you know, postmen about what it's like to be a postman in the Midlands, but it's a lot more interesting um, because it's about <laughs> something that matters to us. It's a great victory for, for the people of Corinderk even now, 130 years later, that their story is being shared with the country. Uh, I first heard about this story, um, the Corinderk story, from Jack Charles, the great actor Jack Charles, whose great-great-grandfather, I think, was one of the petitioners. Um, and the Charles family were, were there, and they're, they're some of the people who we hear from in the story. An insight into the politics of the time. But it's, I have to say, it's very much a celebration, this story, as well. It's very much about blackfellas and whitefellas working together to achieve great things. I grew up kind of knowing about, you know, the stolen generation, the stolen wages, um, all of these kind of current issues that still are very much still part of our politic today. But not knowing necessarily where they came from. So this is a, an insight into that. Three years into this project that we've started at, at Belvoir, for bare stages to have great stories told on them. It's you know one of those venues that has such a heart and a pull on audiences and, and great artists alike. So it's great to be involved in some way. Who's directing? I don't actually know the answer to that. Ask me that question again in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Do you want me to look down the? Again, I saw I saw like a Sydney University Dramatic Society production really? of it. <laughs> That's as good as I've got. <laughs> <laughs>
I've got some pedigree. You know, I have game. I've got some game. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> when else can I get people to come and watch me sing and dance? So I just have to talk. There are so many facets to Hamlet that as soon as you start... To have a piece of work on in, in that space is it's really it's, it's terribly exciting. It's a good amount of chest. I don't look stupid. <laughs> is that filming? It's always going to be better than if it's us going, you know what, you should, you know what, you should do Pericles. And them going, oh, great, yeah, I love Pericles. It's like opening a present at Christmas that you wrapped up for yourself and you know what you put in there. But you don't quite know, like, when you open it up, it's going to be the same thing. So that's completely thrilling. Uh, it's but scary. But I think that's important as an artistic director to kind of be uh, a representative member of the audience somehow. To sort of, to be the kind of advocate for the audience in a way. Um, and what they see and experience it like, like one of them. I am one of them. <laughs>